evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening for the conversation with the town officials sponsored by the League of Women Voters and the Darien Library. Um, but I want to introduce Jean Sweeney, who is kind enough to moderate tonight. She's been a New York attorney for 40 years. That's hard to believe, starting with a career on Wall Street as counsel to money managers and continuing as managing counsel for Maloof and Brown. She has resided in Darien for 24 years with her husband, David Maloof. Jean and Dave raised their two children here and have been an integral part of the community. She has been a member of the League of Women Voters for the past seven years, holding various positions. She's passionate about our democracy being healthy mm -hmm. and is committed to helping Darien evolve as we move forward into this new adventure of living in small town Connecticut post COVID-19. Welcome Jean, and it's time for you to uh, get started and introduce our panelists. Yes, thank you so much for this coming this evening. Um, we have our presentations will be made by um, John Zagroski, who's the board of finance chairman. Um, and then Seth Morton, David Deneen, Steve Olvaney, and Jamie Stevenson. Um, I will in introduce John first. Um, John, if you talk between eight and 10 minutes, I'll let you know when eight minutes is up. Um, and then introduce each person along. Um, and we, if you hold your questions uh, till the end, after everyone's done a presentation, that would be great. And um, Clara will be looking at the questions in the chat and we'll gather them together. And um, at the end of the presentations, we will then go through the questions. So I'll introduce John Zagrowski, who's uh, the Board of Finance Chairman. Um, and he's a resident since 2005 with his wife, Sarah, and now two grown children, Maggie and Jack. Um, he's the in office as the BOF member since 2008, and he's been the chairman since 2015. Uh, his previous town roles were president of the Darien Historical Society, member of the town and police pension boards, member of the Oxridge and Public Works Garage Building Committees. His other roles are currently president of the board at the Foman School in Litchfield, which is a boarding school. He had a career, he's currently um, COO and CFO at the, of the Roan Group, a private equity firm. Uh, he says he's generally charming, handsome and entertaining. So we are looking forward to, you know, something special from you tonight, John, and it's all yours. Thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Gene. It's a pleasure to be here practicing attorney for 40 years. You started when you were five. That, that really is amazing that you uh, got so... Uh, such an early start like that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here and, and to speak with you. We've had these forums before. So what I uh, thought I would try to do is in my eight minutes, uh, break it up a bit and uh, talk about a few things. Uh, the first one is just a, a quick overview of the Board of Finance and its role versus some of the other boards. One of the things I think that's important if you're going to understand town government is to understand the major players and sort of what they do, because if you have that understanding, then when you see the Board of Finance taking action, you'll you'll have a context for assessing what they do because you see how it fits into the broader puzzle. So uh, basically the Board of Selectmen runs the town, the Board of Education runs the schools. The Board of Finance is what I would call the taxpayer representative. Our job is to uh, take a look at spending and try to make sense of that and, and help the town make good decisions. And then all of those decisions for all those boards are ratified uh, in a final vote and a final appropriation by the RTM. So those are the major town boards in terms of the flow. I know we have Steve Mulvaney on, on, on tonight who's going to talk about planning and zoning, which is also very important. But just in terms of overall uh, management of the town, that's how those boards fit together. Major responsibilities for the Board of Finance include our <clears throat> budget process, uh, how we bond and pay for major projects, uh, how we ensure that we have enough financial reserves to meet unexpected needs. Uh, basically, we look at the town's balance sheet as well as the town's income statement and provide some guidance and oversight for that. Uh, the important thing is that um, 
uh, our job is really not what to do. That's really the decision for the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education, but really whether those decisions are financially prudent and then how to pay for them, whether through taxes or drawing down reserves or, or bonding. So examples of our work uh, are around uh, transfers to, to pay for various uh, activities in the town, transferring between financial accounts. Uh, uh, first stop for us in terms of extra spending, if that comes up, is uh, uh, important before it goes to the RTM, and those are called appropriations. And so we spend a very fair bit of time on that. We do a lot of uh, monitoring of major projects, and we try to stay ahead of the curb. As I tell people, my least favorite word in the English language is surprise. I don't like surprises. And so one of the ways we avoid surprises is to try to get out in front of things and understand them. Uh, we also try to uh, serve on various uh, uh, boards and commissions. So I served for eight years on the town and police pension boards. Uh, we have members who serve on building committees, uh, work on shared services, uh, try to participate in union negotiations. And that's really important because a lot of times budgets are impacted by things that don't take place during the budget process. So a, for example, uh, union negotiations and decisions around teacher compensation, that was all decided separately from the Board of Finance budget process. And so it's important for us to have some voice at the table and some kind of representation in that, uh, because again, it, it, it impacts the town's finances. We also spent a fair bit of time with third parties like uh, bond council and ratings agencies, and of course the auditors of the town to try to make sure that we incorporate their best thinking into our work. Probably the most important thing we do is listening. Uh, we've not had a chance to do that as robustly in uh, the time of COVID, but certainly in the past having lots of forums like this where we take Q&A, uh, but also trying to talk to as many people as possible to incorporate their thinking into what, what we do. In terms of recent and future initiatives, I think one of the questions we wanted to address tonight, and we've spent time lately on um, the town's reserves. Uh, reserves are things we've taxed for, but we've put into a reserve and have not spent the money. Our biggest one is called fund balance, which is the town's main financial reserve. And we've recently freshened the policy on that. We've also taken a look at smaller reserves, well, medium-sized reserves like the fire truck apparatus, as well as others. Just again, trying to, to have good hygiene and to clean up that aspect of our uh, budget process. Uh, in addition, we have tried to make things a bit more efficient. The budget process itself has been, I think, streamlined, streamlined quite a bit. In the past, we would replicate a lot of decisions that were already held by the Board of Selectmen and, and Board of Education. And so we've tried to streamline that by just focusing on the things where we had significant questions or needed more understanding. And I think that process works a lot better now. Uh, we've also improved our collaboration with the RTM through a buddy system that really is coordinated with uh, the chairman of F&B. And I think that's worked very well for several years. And again, ensures that we include people in the process and build understanding as we work through a budget um, uh, every year. We've also tried to be proactive uh, this year. That's been mainly around COVID expenditures. And so when the Board of Education had some of those expenditures and didn't have the appropriated funds to take care of them. And that was something that we jumped on right away to make sure that uh, the school system had the funds and resources they needed to uh, ensure the health and safety and protection of uh, families, uh, students, parents, and staff. Um, <clears throat> so in September, or this past December, I announced that I was stepping down from the Board of Finance as uh, Gene said, I've been on the board 13 years and this November it'll be six years as chairman. So I thought I'd round out my last couple of minutes by uh, talking about some things that matter. And I went back and looked at some of my prior addresses and uh, state of the town topic uh, talks. And there's a few things I'd highlight. Um, a lot of what we do is trying to make dispersed government work, not divided. I don't find that our town is all that divided on too many things, but we are dispersed and power and authority and responsibility is dispersed among boards and, and individuals across town. And so there should be a lot of focus, I think, on trying to make that dispersed model work. And what does that require? It requires collaboration, cooperation, and communication. <clears throat> uh, and in order to get that, you need to have time in these roles. I think if you sign up to 
to be a town official, you need to commit to do that for a while because it takes time to build understanding uh, and to build relationships. And if you have a good reputation in town in terms of how you do things and how you collaborate with others, uh, you can get a lot done. And if you don't, you can't. Um, another point that I'd raise is um, uh, what I would describe as four pillars, which I brought up in my 2015 State of the Town Address. There are a few things that I think we can focus on as a town to ensure that within our group of, of peer towns or benchmark towns, that we're the most efficient of that group. And it's around capital project execution, which uh, with the building committee structure, our first selectman put in place, I think is vastly better uh, in the last few years. Uh, paying attention to staffing level, levels, it's expensive to hire people and we should, we should make sure those decisions are, are well thought out. Uh, managing future liabilities and not promising things we have not paid for. And then finally, trying to share services among authorities in town so that we get the most efficient execution as possible. And I would say over the last few years since I've made those comments that we've done an excellent job with that. Um, I guess finally, I'd say um, it's important to pay attention to Hartford. We make a lot of decisions on our own here in town and I think do a good job. But Hartford makes a lot of important decisions too. And uh, certainly in the media lately, there's been uh, talk of a lot of uh, serious decisions that could come down and impact the town of Darien uh, far beyond our ability to control. And so one of the things I certainly do, and I know every town official on this call, and I would encourage every voter, is to pay close attention to what Hartford's doing and what it could uh, do to possibly impact this town and make sure your voice is heard among uh, those elected officials as well as the elected officials gathered before you uh, today. So I think my eight minutes is about up. I did want to, again, thank the folks for organizing this particular uh, forum. I think it's terrific. And then just to uh, thank everybody who's uh, supported me over the years. It's been a privilege to serve in this role and uh, terrific to be part of discussions like this. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, John. That was um, really fabulous. Uh, thumbnail on, on your role and what's going on. And we certainly are um, disappointed that you won't, won't stay for another Well, year there's hundreds so. of videos on me. So if you get bored, you could pull them up and watch them, so. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, okay, so we then, uh, I'm sorry. Then we have David Deneen, who's the Board of Education Chairman. Um, He's here. Yes. Okay. Yes, he's here. So David, David Deneen is also known as Duke. Um, and he's the Board of Education Chairman. He was elected chairman in 2020. He's new. Uh, he's co-chair of the Oxridge Building Committee. Oof. Elected to the Board of Education in 2014. He's lived in Darien for 25 years, is married to a Darien native and has three daughters. He's a member of the advisory board of the Darien Depot. He previously served on the Environmental Protection Commission and served eight years as a Darien firefighter. Also to name a few volunteer commitments, he has been the trustee of the Nor Norwalk Maritime Aquarium, a volunteer for Tiny Miracles Foundation and a volunteer for the New York City Police Athletic League. So I'll give it to, to um, David to let us know what his role is in the town. Well, thank you, Jean. I, I appreciate that introduction. Um, <clears throat> and good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to thank the League of Women Voters in Darien, uh, fellow town officials and members of the community who are watching. Uh, on behalf of the members of the Board of Ed, it's a pleasure to update you on the work uh, that we do for the children and the families of Darien. I think a real, <clears throat> a real quick short story uh, about a feel of getting back to normalcy, which I think we're all welcoming. I had the opportunity last week to go see one of my daughters in a concert up at the high school out in the courtyard. So uh, these concerts have been missed, but the music continues behind the scenes. And it was good to see a public concert in the courtyard of the high school and all the other activities going around the high school. So I think we're, we're headed in the right direction, thanks to a lot of hard work by a lot of folks locally and uh, how we've managed the COVID situation. Um, I am a relatively newly appointed chair of the Board of Education. 
Um, we are a group of nine elected volunteers. We are your neighbors, your friends, and uh, all live in town, and most all of us have children in school. I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and recognize the hard work of the members of the Board of Ed also, past and present, express appreciation to the superintendent. We have uh, some type of bond with the fact that we're both Irish. He's actually from Ireland, so I'm a couple of generations removed, but uh, a good bond there. Um, I also want to thank the administration, principals and assistant principals, teachers and the sports staff and the facilities team for their tireless efforts over the last uh, 18, almost two years. I need to thank also a lot of the groups that support us. It's a lot of volunteer effort by local PTOs, CDSPs, and a host of volunteers that make this a community focused and uh, very focused investment in education each year. As many know by now, we've approved a $106 million budget for the next school year. Thank you for all the support and work by the administration, the schools, the Board of Ed, Board of Finance, the RTM and subcommittees, along with support from our first selectmen and the Board of Selectmen. I do hear compliments regularly from other districts and towns about how we've handled COVID and also about our process, our open dialogue and ongoing investment in technology and how we deliver a fiscally responsible budget. I'll touch on a couple of topics around COVID, the budget, facilities and ongoing educational learning. It's really been an unprecedented, an unprecedented year with a lot of challenges. Navigating the COVID-19 health crisis um, has been a collaborative effort between students, staff, parents, and town agencies. We're particularly proud that we've been able to keep our children in school throughout a majority of the pandemic. I constantly hear when I'm out and about and on other calls throughout the state and through Fairfield County, we're looked at as kind of a beacon of hope and how things can be done. And uh, that will continue as we wind down the year and go into the new year. I have to express our appreciation for the administration and teachers. Uh, they made it happen for the Darien children. Um, complete overnight transformation of the school district to an online district back in March, 2020, when we think about it, to the development of a comprehensive reopening plan back in July, and to all the care and support provided to our children every day. Maintaining a quality education for our students and families was only done through additional resources supported by all the town bodies and the greater community and a lot of effort by our health professionals. I have to extend a special appreciation to Alicia Kosucci, Director of Nursing COVID-19 Compliant Liaison, Mr. David Knopf, Town Health Director, and Dr. Timothy Kenefect, School District Medical Advisor. These individuals have worked tirelessly on behalf of the school and Darien community and their efforts have shown in how we've gotten kids back to school and kept them in school. This year, we also completed our strategic plan under the guidance of the superintendent and Dr. Richard Lemons of the Connecticut Center for School Change. The board engaged in a process of strategic planning to identify the next level of work for the district. It was overseen by a committee consisting of 27 members representing students, staff, parents, community members, and members of the board. Thank you for all those involved. The strategic plan was recently adopted by the Board of Education, and it is a blueprint that will guide the board and district's work over the next five years. I think the overall investment uh, that the town values on education. Currently, the district serves about 4,680 children. Eight, uh, grades K through 12 with approximately another 100 children in ELP. The enrollment shows stable growth over the next decade. The district is known for academic excellence and remains a highly desirable school system for parents and staff. The taxpayers receive a tremendous return on investments when comparing academic achievement in other Connecticut districts. Our students continue to perform across standardized testing. It's at exceptional levels. We had five national merit semifinalists and 20 commended scholars this year. The U.S. World and News Report 2021 named Darien High School number one public high school in the state of Connecticut and Newsweek named Darien High School one of the 100 best STEM high schools in the nation. The district was also just recognized as one of the best communities for music education by the NAM Foundation. 
our Middlesex Quiz Bowl uh, teams and secondary technology students continue to experience team and individual accolades and championships. And I think we all know the success of our athletes and sports teams. And as I said, we have an incredible music program and an, an incredible theater program that's getting back to some normalcy, but we'll have some fun outdoor concerts and events as we wind down the year. We got through the 2021 budget process. Thank you for all of those that supported the budget this year. As I said previously, some highlights and further investments in the budget, providing students and allowing our youngest learners to go to one-to-one -one on technology, the new elementary special education assistant principals to support the delivery of special ed, the teacher and residence program to support diversity goals as outlined in our strategic plan we're very excited about, uh, the implementation of the Yale Ruler Original Origami to support social and emotional learning, continuing to support STEM initiatives, maintaining reasonable class, sizing, class sizes, and continuing to improve our network and wireless infrastructure. Our supportive PTOs and community continue to support the schools, and we recently received a $213,000 donation from the Darien Foundation to establish a K-12 through robotics club in all of our schools. We're excited uh, to see the construction of Ox Ridge. We have a celebration this weekend, Saturday at Ox Ridge, kind of a delayed groundbreaking, but the state-of-the-art building will be a tremendous building for our elementary schools when it opens in 2023. There is a live stream, live stream camera that often offers the construction in real time. It's an exciting project um, and it's been expertly managed by a dedicated building committee overseen by Kip Coons, who is also Board of Selectmen. It's a $63 million project, which will be open spring of 2023 and provide generations of Darien children the state-of-the-art education. We're also considering the adoption of ed specs to remove the portables and improve libraries at Hinley, Homes, and Royal, and that project looks to kick off shortly. The district also improved the quality of food service for our students and staff. Uh, we heard this morning at a finance committee, we had a record month for food sales at the school. So I think the uh, changeover to chart rails to redesign our food service program uh, is gonna be a success and we look forward to hearing and seeing more about that next year. Uh, kind of the next level of work. Last year, we celebrated Dr. Adley's appointment as the new superintendent of schools. It was certainly timely in preparing to face the challenges presented by this unusual year. And his character, experience and care have helped successfully guide the district through these uncharted times. We are in the process of hiring three new building principals for Middlesex, Hinley, and Tokenique. Uh, we wanna congratulate Mrs. Summers and Mrs. Michelson on their retirements and all their dedicated service to our students. Also congratulate Mrs. Droller on her new appointment as District Director of Elementary Education. Both curriculum and business departments have been restructured to better deliver services and staff. Some additional thoughts as I wind this down. Our plans right now are to open the school in the fall in a more normal setting. That is our goal. We want kids in schools and uh, we want our kids learning. Um, we're going to participate in the expansion of the open choice program in the region, which is exciting. We're moving forward with the teacher and residence program. We will continue to focus on supporting the mental health and social emotional needs for our students. This is more important than ever will be an important focus for the board work and the administration work over this summer and into the new school year. We are going to hear about and implement a new technology plan to support teaching and learning. And uh, we are working through uh, the American Rescue Grant to continue to support students as they trans transition back in the next school year. So on behalf of the Board of Education, just thank you for tonight's opportunity and thank you to all the other chairs and our first selectmen. Um, I think we have a great working team in town, went through a good budget process, our focus is on education, and our focus is doing what's right for our students uh, in their education in this great community. Thank you. Um, thank you, Duke. That was just fabulous. Um, I'm sure we all learned a few things, um, and we, and I'm sure everyone is was truly in awe of the Darien schools um, through COVID. It, it just was amazing how well we did. Um, so I'll introduce Steve Olvaney, and he's chairman of Planning and Zoning Commission, and he was elected chair in 2019. 
He's been a member of Planning and Zoning Commission since 2013. He's a former member of the RTM Planning, Zoning and Housing Committee. And he's also served on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, he's been a youth sports coach and a long term, long time town government volunteer. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you to, to talk about um, your role in the town. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you for the opportunity and um, having me tonight. Um, at one point in my life in town, I was also a member of the League of Women Voters. Um, I don't think I was recruited this last couple of years to be a member, but you know, I'll join again someday soon. Um, I'm also up for re-election in November, and if my wife and kids allowed me to run, I might be in for a third term. Um, I actually do honestly love this job. Um, my presentation tonight is basically going to be in three parts. First, I'll briefly discuss what the roles and responsibilities are of the Planning Zoning Commission and how the commission functions. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, goings on up in Hartford that um, John Zagrotsky touched on and how they could directly affect us here in Darien. And at the end, I will wrap up with some updates regarding the three large mixed use projects that are now underway in Darien and about to begin in earnest. Um, the roles and responsibility of the Planning Zone Commission, um, it's an elected body created underneath the town charter. There are six members of the commission and there are no alternates. Um, the, first select, the first select person is an ex officio member of the PNZ as well as the um, Department of Public Works director is an ex officio member of the PNC. What that means is they can tell us what they want, but they just don't get the vote. Um, we are we are elected members on the PNC commission. Uh, we are not appointed. That is different some, from some other towns in the state of Connecticut where the, their PNCs are appointed and not elected. Um, the PNC commission members have uh, four year terms and the commission meets about 10 times, uh, 30 times a year, which is basically supposed to be three weeks a month times 10 months. We don't work in August and um, December, but uh, we've been a little bit busy lately. Um, in the month of May, we had five meetings. So that's actually about what we're doing. Um, it, our town is in combination, as, has a zoning function and a planning function. Some towns across the state have a zoning board and a planning board that are separate, ours are together. Thus, the Darien, the Planning Zoning Commission, is both short term um, responsibilities as also, and along with a long term focus. The powers and duties of the function are outlined in the Connecticut state statutes, um, and these include act, the enactment of map of uh, enactment and amendments of zoning regulations, enactment and amendments of subdivision regulations, um, enactment and amendments of the town plan of conservation and development. It's a plan that's retired, um, required by state statute, and it gets updated every 10 years. Um, the commission's also um, responsible for removal application for property owners for coastal site plan review if you live near the water flood damage for prevention applications, um, business site plan applications, special permit applications, if you wanna do something on your house that requires a special permit, subdivision applications. We also, this year relative to COVID, we did a, a lot of temporary approvals to allow for outdoor activities for our businesses in town, which basically really included um, a lot of the outdoor a lot of the outdoor dining that you guys, that you may have seen and hopefully um, very much patronized. Um, the Connecticut statute is a, is a guide for all of our public hearings, including what we are required to have a public hearing on, such as a zoning map or regulation changes and other items that we may have a public hearing on in our town. Um, from the day of an application is filed, we have to act on it within 65 days from the day the, the public hearing and the application is um, started, we have to close the application in 65 days. Um, to get a, any application approved, you generally need, or, or denied, you generally need um, four members to vote in um, the favor of an approval or of a denial. 
Um, we work cl very closely with the Zoning Board of Appeals in town, the Environmental Protection Commission in town, the Architectural Review Board in town. And of course, we work with the, the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, the Board of Education, along with the Public Works Department, um, the local traffic authority, and also the parking authority. Um, the next piece that I want to talk about is what is going on um, up in Hartford. It, as just a note, much of what the commission can or cannot do is dictated by state law. As many of you in um, town residents may have heard, and it's been a lot on the front page of the paper, there are a number of bills up in Hartford that could affect the zoning and housing issues here at the local level. Some of them are, are wide reaching, but at this point, none of them have been approved um, by, the gov by the governor. Our commission has been and will of course follow these state requirements or mandates that come out of these bills. Um, and we will enact them as we are directed to by the state. Um, you may have heard about a group called Desegregate CT, which put forth a platform that has advocated strongly for more multifamily housing affordable housing and middle income housing. Many of the bills are related, many of the pending bills are related to that platform. Um, as a matter of course, there was an approval of a bill tonight um, that was, I think it was, they called dropping a bill. The amendments were dropped this afternoon and I think it was approved tonight. Um, Jamie Stevenson is very much involved in that and on top of it and she may wanna speak about that because I did not, that did not have a chance to review much of that today. Um, first, the commission put together zoning regulations and amendments for, most recently, the zoning commission has put together zoning regulations and remember, amendments proposed for three changes. Right now, we're working on the elimination of minimum apartment sizes um, in nearly all, in nearly all multi all zones that now have such requirements. In the town of Darien, we have a requirement for um, larger units in town. I think it's basically about a thousand square feet or 800 square feet, and we're gonna change that requirement that's in discussion. We're also looking at reducing the parking requirements for multifamily and um, combination of housing. And finally, we're also going to look at our inclusionary housing zone um, regulation in town. Right now, anyone that wants to build five or more units, which is really the trigger is four, um, is a 12% requirement for an affordable housing component. We're looking to change that to a different number. Um, we've, had, we, we've had public meetings on these three matters, and they're going to be continued again on June 8th if anybody wants to watch them. There's a fourth item that is on our list to look at. Um, once we would say, made a decision on the other items, the commission's gonna put forth a proposal to amend our regulations to allow accessory apartments. They're also known as ADUs, which means accessory dwelling units. Um, it's basically, in a lot of instances, um, an apartment that's in a pool house or a guest cottage or a garage apartment lot. The staff right now is doing research and work and we'll get started over the next month or two. Um, by then we will know what if any of the bills that may have been passed in Hartford um, that were on those topics and any associated state requirements are relative to the issues that we just spoke about and we'll be able to respond if required. The ADE proposal will also have a public hearing so please be involved and be attached. Uh, we will continue to monitor what's going up in Hartford, any ramifications on our, for our town on the local level, and any action that we have to do, and we will, of course, will comply with any of those regulations. We did hold, hold a public hearing on the regulations. Um, a number of people attended, a number of people put in um, testimony, and we also wrote letters to our delegation up in Hartford on that. Um, Next, the other one that we want to talk about is the current mixed use projects we have in town. There are three large mixed use projects in town. They're now underway. Some have started, some are halfway in the process. And I think everyone is really interested in those. The first one we're gonna talk about is what we call the federal project. That is the prior and old um, stop and shop in the Norton Heights area. 
with the adjacent um, Walgreens. The project area is located between West Avenue Heights Road, just east of Edgerton. Phase one is basically complete, which was the construction of the new Walgreens. The construction of the other buildings are underway. The largest building will be a mixed use building with retail and restaurants on the first floor at 122 residents apartment above. It will take about two or three more years to complete the entire project. No new additional commercial tenants have been yet announced at this point. Um, I've personally spoken to the project matter a few times. There are some very exciting tenants that will go there. It's all confident confidential at this point. Um, and I would break that confidence if I told anybody that I wasn't supposed to. As part of the project, significant drainage improvements were made by federal, which should help to address the, fl the flooding, which occasionally occurred along Heights Road for the large storms. If you remember, I said this a couple of different times, they basically built a one and a half times, one and a half Olympic swimming pools below the parking lot that sits in front of Walgreens. That's a lot of water that can be held. It will dissipate once the pools get filled up and it will not, it should not affect anything else in town. The next project I wanna talk about is the Corbin project that's been put forth by Baywater Properties and a gentleman that's a local resident named David Genovese. That project lives on both sides of Corbin Drive along the post road, basically directly across the street from the Darien Sports Shop and the old Darien Playhouse. It includes a Corbin building and the post office behind it, which will both be demolished as part of that project. The first real phase, first real phase of the project is, will be underway um, basically next month with the, with the demolition of the existing gas station that's on the corner and the two other small single story office buildings behind on Corbin Drive. The other buildings on the Northeast side of Corbin Drive will also be de demolished. Those ones I just spoke about. This is also a mixed use project with restaurants and retail space on the ground floor and upper floor apartments totaling about 116 residential units, 31 bedrooms and 86 two bedrooms. There will also be, I think an 80 to 90,000 square foot office building as part of the project. It should take about three more years to complete the project. Um, and the project will be constructed in a number of phases. The final project I'm gonna speak about a little bit is the Neroten Heights Shopping Center, also known as the Palmer's Project. This area has been fenced off, which is near the corner of Hollow Tree Ridge Road and Heights Road. The existing commercial buildings are to be demolished, the ones that have been fenced in. The Palmer's Market in the way it sits today will, will remain intact. Some of the tenants in the other buildings were moved to the lower level of the project of the Palmer's Market. The project was approved about two years ago in 2019, 2018 and updated in 2019. It should consist of an additional 24,400 square feet of retail space. It's a little bit of an increase what used to be there. Um, another 86, 8,600 square feet of restaurant space, an increase of about another two and a half thousand square feet of what was there. And then 59 residential apartments, 19 one bedrooms and 42 bedrooms. Um, the approval will turn the property into more, the, the, the approval will turn this property into more active space with more restaurants and residents. I met earlier this week with representatives of the Palmer family with Jamie Stevenson and some of the people on the PNZ staff um, and the project has been on hold for a while, but we do expect the project to come off hold in a short amount of time and come to the forefront again very soon. They are and may request another special permit for a, another confidential tenant they're talking to, which may create some new changes to their approval. Again, this is an election year. I am up for re-election. We're always looking for other people to be on the Planning Zoning Commission. We need additional Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated people. Um, the, there is an unaffiliated chairman of the Planning Zoning Commission in the town of Greenwich. And the last thing we'd like to say is congratulations to Christina McNamara, Krista McNamara, who just got appointed um, the new town clerk. And I wanna do a special other one to a woman that, 
that I think is very warm of a distinction named Susan Schultz. So as a little advertisement or plug for her, if the League of Women Voters does do something for women of distinction, I would love you, I would love to nominate her. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your time. And at the end, with appropriate time, I'm here for any questions that you may have. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Steve. That was great. And I know everyone in Darien wants to thank you so much for um, allowing the seating on the restaurants to go out onto the sidewalks. It's made a huge difference um, and it's it's really been great. I don't know if you'll allow it to stay, but you might want to consider it. <laughs> I can tell you that um, we, were, we were the first town in the state of Connecticut to allow outdoor dining and we have already extended it into uh, through October of this year. So yes, you can have outdoor dining all the way through oh, 2021. Oh, okay. Well, great. Well, I really want to thank you for that. Um, so our, our, our last presenter is, is Jamie Stevenson, um, who I'm, I'm not sure I, I need to really introduce. We all know Jamie um, and she's our first selectman. And um, she's just led this town through um, this uh, COVID-19. And I, I, I can't even begin to tell you, um, and my hat is off to you. Um, so she is a 30 year resident of Darien and her husband grew up in Darien. She has five children, one grandchild and another on the way. <laughs> <She just, laughs> good luck. <laughs> Um, she was elected first selectman in 2009, and she was elected the first term as first selectman in, in 2011, and she has been reelected four times since. Um, she's elected by chief elected pair, peers to serve on West Co and the chair and the vice chair twice, and she currently serves as vice, vice chair. Um, she's currently the chair of the Southwest Region Metropolitan Planning Organization, the immediate past chair of CIRMA, and she's currently the first vice chair of CCM. She uh, is a board member of the Rowayton Center and a board member of LifeBridge Community Services. And um, Jamie, you are um, the puppeteer behind there, kind of having everybody coordinate and um, we are look forward to hearing from you to do your presentation. Thank you so much, Jean. I really appreciate that. And um, as far as puppeteering goes, you know, there's there's like a thousand people in Darien that um, all conspire to work together to make our town as great as it can be. Um, I am fortunate to have been able to serve as your first selectman um, for a number of years, but I have extremely capable colleagues on the board of selectmen that work collaboratively um, with me and the staff, uh, as well as all of these fine people on the call tonight and uh, everybody who works together. So um, thank you for that, that very nice introduction. And um, as always, I appreciate so much the opportunity that the League of Women Voters gives us to talk to the public and for the Darien Library to host this virtual discussion tonight. I hope and pray that next year's event will be in person. Um, much better to see folks, but I will say that being around and about town today, um, seeing people outside without masks and uh, seeing their smiling faces has been incredible, a great joy and uh, lots of relief on the face of a lot of people. Um, I, wanted, I want to express my deep gratitude to my fellow board members, colleagues, and all town and school administration and staff for the extraordinary collaborative efforts over the past 14 pandemic months. It's been a very stressful time for so many, a frightening time also. Heck, my hair turned gray through it all. Um, town leaders and staff have been unwavering in their willingness to rise to each and every challenge and pivot uh, pretty quickly when necessary. As if a once in a lifetime, hopefully pandemic wasn't enough, we managed racial discord and anti-police movement in the wake of the George Floyd murder. For the public record, I wanna say that I stand 100% behind the highly trained and skilled men and women in blue 
put themselves in harm's way 24 7 365 to keep our town and our schools safe hats off to the wonderful people at the darien police department I'm very proud of the fact that town, Darien Town Hall never stopped serving the public through the pandemic. We moved services online. Uh, we created uh, by appointment only services to keep uh, the public and our staff safe. Uh, it's one of the many blessings of living in a small town that we were able to do that and do that quickly. And I'm also proud to share that we were one of the first, possibly even the first of 169 towns to fully reopen to the general public while still addressing the safety concerns of our staff and the public themselves. So a little bit about COVID, I'm sure you all got my Thursday message. I will be happy when I don't have to call you every Thursday, but as long as we're under the emergency declarations and executive orders, I'm sure you wanna keep updated on a regular basis. Um, We've been existing under those declarations and executive orders uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Many of them have been now extended to various periods between now and July 20th. So we're sorting through what all that means for us here locally. I was proud to share with you today that um, our positivity rate in Darien is 0.019%. I think we've had two cases of COVID in the past three weeks. So really positive trend. Um, testing, we were one of the first towns in uh, our region to offer in-town testing. Um, we had to find our own providers because uh, the state wasn't gonna support testing for communities like uh, Darien and others like us. And I wanna give a huge shout out to the Darien Public School nurses who immediately stepped forward and volunteered at our first testing site over at the Darien High School. They've been incredible all the way through, uh, including at our vaccine clinics that still continue. So it is, it is the most wonderful and extraordinary example of uh, collaboration between the Darien Public Schools and uh, the town of Darien and the Board of Selectmen. You can still get tested if you need to. Everpoint is still operating in the Leroy West parking lot and we'll be there for as long as we need them. Uh, vaccines has been a really incredible bright spot for us um, through the hard work of our health director and our human service department and a number of community volunteers. And I said school nurses, doctors, um, EMS providers, they all came together uh, to put together an extraordinary vaccine clinic that has served so many, uh, both within our community and beyond. Um, through all of this, you would think that with um, COVID shutdowns, that volunteerism would wane. And I would argue that actually volunteerism um, uh, was uh, exponentially increased through the pandemic, which is um, so heartwarming. The Darien Foundation in collaboration with Baywater Properties um, developed Corbin Cares, just an incredible uh, effort to feed the people that needed to be fed in our community, restaurant uh, workers, um, emergency medical personnel, and most especially the seniors from our senior program who still get drive-through lunches to this day um, with our chef working in the senior center, even though our seniors can't be back yet in person, but very soon they will be back in person. The community fund held the mask brigade providing um, homemade masks for our, our small business employees in town. The Darien Chamber collaborated with the Small Business Association and representatives from the Darien Men's Association uh, to support our small businesses and help them navigate the bureaucracy of the PPP programs and all those other uh, grant programs that were available to them. And of course, as was already mentioned tonight, uh, the Board of Selectmen and the Planning and Zoning Commission's support of outdoor dining. And I'm right there with you, Jean. I hope that the Planning and Zoning Commission, as, as uh, Steve said, I don't have a vote, but I'll, I'll voice my support for continued expanded outdoor dining. It's really brought a sense of vibrancy to our downtown um, that I hope that we can um, help sustain that. Um, there's so many organizations to thank, um, but I want to especially thank person to person who've helped the most vulnerable in our community, the YMCA, the YWCA, 
and all of our faith communities who have really been that rock of support for people as they had uh, physical and um, social and emotional challenges over the past 14 months. Um, never before have we seen the importance of communication and coordination, which we did on a daily basis with the governor's office, the State Department of Public Health, West Cog, the State Department of Education, and everybody else who worked collectively to help manage the pandemic. Um, it also became very clear through COVID. One of the things that I like to look back on um, is all of the teaching moments that, that have presented themselves in the past year. And one thing became abundantly clear, and that is how precious our outdoor environments are for our residents. Our parks, our beaches, our roadways, our sidewalks, um, and how important it is for us to continue to invest in those environments. I think everybody um, fell in love again with our beautiful community outdoors, and um, I know that the Board of Selectmen will continue to support efforts to, um, to enhance those. Federal response um, it has been extraordinary as well. We are now looking at the American Rescue Plan dollars that will be coming to the town of Darien. We are expected to get $6.3 million to the town. The schools will get additional and directed funding. Um, we will be developing a process in collaboration with um, the Board of Finance and other town officials to determine how we should best spend that money. Um, to help us recover from COVID. Everything has to be related to uh, impacts from COVID. So um, more of that will come very shortly. But in spite of COVID, the Board of Selectmen has continued to address all the normal things that we do every day for the town of Darien. You heard earlier that a uh, successful budget process occurred through COVID in our virtual world. Shout out to the RTM and to Kate Bush who helped manage uh, and TV 79 who helped manage those virtual meetings. Um, uh, thank you to the RTM for supporting $46.1 million for the Board of Selectmen's budget. Um, just an, a note and a reminder that the Board of Selectmen carry all of the town's debt service and the Darien Library's operating budget in our budget. Um, and also to remember that the town budget really isn't just a spending plan. It is a reflection of our community values. And you can see clearly that we highly value public education and are willing to dedicate uh, tax revenue resources to make sure that we have best in class public education. Um, you've heard a little bit about the Oxridge Elementary School. Super proud to share that it's on time and under budget. Um, many thanks to our very able co-chairman, Duke Deneen and Kip Coons. The new processes that we put in place with the town barrage are really yielding significant benefits to the town with these large capital projects. Um, and I hope that those will continue well into the future. Um, we're on the, uh, the cusp of finishing up the landscaping up at Highland Farms. Everybody has loved that walking path that we created, the ADA walking path. Um, and, and who knew that it would be such great timing um, with COVID and, and the desire for everybody to, to get outside. Um, we're, we're looking forward to finishing up that project and making it as beautiful as we can. We are going to do a little cleanup at 30 Edgerton and make that a little bit more usable open space for the general public again in deference to the fact that um, people really want to enjoy our outdoor spaces um, and we have very few of those. So this will become, uh, I think a really treasured little sort of pocket open space, looking forward to that. Board of Selectmen is also doing a little bit of a charter review. Um, by no means are we stepping on the toes of the RTM, but we saw some things in the charter that were uh, inconsistencies with policies and procedures that we uh, utilize today. So we want to help identify some of those and move those on to the RTM for their deliberations. Darien train station platforms are going to be replaced. And as part of that, the town is funding some shelters for our commuters, a great partnership, first time ever partnership with uh, the town of Darien and Connecticut DOT 
um, to, we're supporting Connecticut DOT with the funding for those shelters. And um, quite frankly, the DOT was shocked that we were willing to participate in that. But I think it presents a very good new model for uh, local towns who want to get some things done in partnership um, with the state of Connecticut in new and unique ways. Um, big conversations happening right now and importantly to address sidewalk maintenance, crosswalks, pedestrian safety in general. The Board of Selectmen is going to be working hard to make sure that we are keeping the sidewalks that we have in the best possible shape. Um, that may mean that we have to remove some trees that are in the sidewalks that are creating unsafe conditions. Um, but safety first is certainly our motto. So um, we will do our best to replace trees when we can, but we have to make our sidewalks safe. And we also wanna look at places where we can add new sidewalks since we know that everybody really wants Darien to be a very walkable community and we support that initiative. Um, we are going to undertake an emergency services review to make sure that um, we have kept pace with um, the be best in class emergency services and administration thereof. So um, that will be a very important project in the coming months. And we also continue to look at administrative and financial efficiencies uh, and how we can improve customer service for everybody in town. I too want to uh, congratulate Krista McNamara for her new role as Darianne's town clerk. She'll take that job uh, um, officially on June 1st. And I look forward to working with my board to appoint a new Republican member to fill the vacancy on the board of selectmen. Uh, there's always so much going on. I, I certainly could go on and on, but I've taken up my eight minutes and then some. But I look forward to any questions that members of the public might have. And thank you to the league for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Jamie. So I will move to Seth. Um, Seth, you are um, the RTM moderator. And um, by way of background, Seth and his wife, Linda, moved to Darien in 1973. He joined the RTM in 1985, serving first on the Education Committee, and then a few years later, moving over to the Finance and Budget Committee. He served as chair of the Finance and Budget Committee for 17 years before being elected to the Board of Selectmen in 2007. After two years on the Board of Selectmen from 2007 to 2009, he returned to the RTM and was elected moderator in 2015, where he served presently. Um, he has three daughters who went K through 12 to the Darien schools and coached the Darien Midget Travel Hockey from 1975 to 1980 and Darien Girls Travel Soccer from 1980 to 2000. Um, he feels fortunate to live in Darien as we all do. Um, and during this time is, is, was, has been able to um, contribute to the families and the, and the government. So Seth, I'll hand it over to you to talk about your role here in the town. Thank you so much, uh, Gina. I do send you uh, greetings from the Long Island Expressway and we could talk about that later. Um, uh, I am uh, the moderator, which means that um, I run the, the meetings of the representative town meeting, just a uh, hundred of your closest friends. Um, we've been doing it uh, virtually uh, and uh, as, as uh, Jamie mentioned, we have to thank Kate Bush for helping us hold this whole thing together. A hundred people on Zoom, let me, or uh, something similar to Zoom, is, uh, is uh, something uh, that's, um, how can I put it, exciting to say the least. Uh, we, uh, we have just passed, uh, the representative town meeting has just passed the uh, town budget and uh, Yes, we, we uh, approved 46 uh, odd million for selectmen and uh, 106 million uh, for the uh, Board of Education. And uh, the total of the mill rate was 16.84%. And that's a, a big part of what the, the RTM does. The representative town meeting has, is, is split up into 
seven committees and the committees handle different aspects of the town, the, the, uh, the operation of the town. We have a finance and budget committee, education committee, park and rec, uh, public works, public health and safety, TGSNA, that's town government and structure. Um, it relates to changing uh, the charter or changing ordinances and also any uh, changes in uh, the town laws and uh, planning, zoning and housing. So um, these, uh, the, the rules committee is the committee that sets the agenda. The moderator is the chair of the rules committee and the moderator of the RTM. The rules committee uh, also assigns committees to work on different items which are gonna come before the RTM so that during RTM meetings, the committees get up and report out on uh, items which are on the agenda. And uh, at the annual meeting, which we just concluded, everybody got a chance to speak. All the committees, I think, got a chance to speak. And uh, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, let's say, unusual for one meeting. <clears throat> um, in addition to uh, approving funds uh, expended by town bodies, uh, the RTM, uh, also uh, approves contracts, approves legislation. Uh, we do things like nominate people for the Five Mile River Commission. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be nom nominating a, a candidate for the technology committee of the, of the town that has been formed by the Board of Selectmen. So uh, there's a, a lot that, that uh, goes on in the RTM. Uh, basically, if you want to sign a, a contract with the town of Darien, it'll come through the uh, art, through the uh, um, through the RTM. And uh, if you want to spend any money, it basically comes through the RTM one way or another. That's the best way to explain uh, what what we're doing. Uh, we look forward to, to uh, working with Ms. McNamara. Uh, we, the amount of time that we spend working with the, the town government is significant. Uh, we work a lot with a town clerk to be able to coordinate all the documentation that we need and uh, also to help distribute uh, all of our warnings and different agendas. So uh, we certainly look forward to working with Kristen and uh, we thank Lisa Buxton, who's been operating and helping us in the uh, in the interim. Um, one uh, new thing that we did, uh, we found that in using GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, these uh, systems that allow us to see each other here tonight, uh, in order to keep abreast of changes and also to make it work efficiently, we formed a technology committee in the rules committee uh, headed by Lois Schneider and uh, they really have done a lot to, to help us orchestrate a meeting with 100 people and, and uh, be able to, uh, to record the votes and, uh, and uh, be able to allow people to participate in the meeting uh, in an efficient way so that uh, uh, we can effectively use this, this system. So uh, my thanks to uh, Lois in, in, in her efforts and also uh, to the rules committee in uh, in helping helping us put together these agendas and and to get the job done, so that uh, that I think uh, pretty much gives you an idea of the RTM and uh, what we do. Great, Seth. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your um, coming and joining us this evening and giving us a quick and dirty overview of the RTM. Oh, um, by the way, let me, let me introduce uh, Clara, since she, she's here. Clara is the chair of the Education Committee. Okay, that's very nice of you. Um, I, I think we're running, um, thank you, Seth. Um, Jean, we're, we're gonna start to try to get some questions in now, is that okay? Right, so thank you, Seth. So, um, so Clara uh, has been gathering the questions and um, will, um, I guess, uh, ask the questions to the um, 
participant to the presenters. Okay, and for all the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A, uh, and I will pick them up um, and ask the um, particular town leader who can probably answer the question. Um, anybody who feels that they have something to contribute to the answer, please just um, chime in. One of the questions that has come up is, are you concerned that our town is getting too developed? I wonder if this is a planning and zoning question or perhaps a question for Mrs. Stevenson. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Albany or Mrs. Stevenson would like to comment. I think I'll turn it to Steve first. I'm happy, I'm happy to answer, but they do the technical work and do all the reviews on the impacts of development. So I think from a technical perspective, he would be a good person to start. Uh, thank you, Jamie. I was gonna let you start, but that's okay. You're the boss, you're allowed to do that. Um, it's 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 a balance. It's definitely a balance. The majority of the town is zoned for um, multi-story buildings, but the majority of the town in the older sections have single-story buildings. Just by way of example, if you look at the Corbin District area on the Post Road, those are all single-story buildings. Also, the ones around Corbin Drive on the left-hand side are also single-story buildings. Um, every single building has an economic life and a useful life. Um, when when buildings get beyond their useful life, it's time for, for them to get to redevelop. Um, I am a big fan of suburban renewal, which is what I call it versus urban renewal. Um, the thing that the PNZ has to be cognizant of, and we, we do it in certain ways, is capacity issues of the town. We have, we have a finite capacity issue relative to schools. Um, you only have so many classrooms in town and you can only put so many kids in a classroom in town. Um, there, is a, there is a strategic plan, I'm guessing. Um, and I do actually know that they wanna get rid of the portables in town, but that's something that we can only partially regulate. We did come up with a, um, a, a senior living overlay zone where most people and other towns who have it, they're 55 and over or 63 and over, I think is the number. The, the reason for those districts is um, most of those people that are 55 and older and 65 and older, and I'm actually 57, don't have kids in schools. Um, I do have two kids in schools, so that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a difference there. It's 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 very it's a very hard thing to look at. Um, it's a very hard thing to control, but we also have capacity issues relative to water, to sewer, to traffic. All of those items get looked at. If a special permit is required for a development, and in our opinion, um, it exceeds the um, capacity of a roadway in town or of a sewer district in town, that needs to be addressed. And that's something that um, will actually probably be denied or reworked to be able to fit inside our town. I think that partially answered your question. Thank you. Yeah. Would you, would you like happy. to add, Jamie? Yes, I would. So um, I think the key is balance. Um, and the other benefit of being in a small town where our planning and zoning commission and other boards and commissions make the decisions locally with public input through public hearing process really helps to make sure that the projects and the developments that move forward are the ones that the people of our town want. And we saw in this legislative session how um, you know, the, the thought process was to begin to remove local authority over some of those things. Um, and that could be a challenge to helping to balance factors like open space, the environment, the sensitivity to the Long Island Sound. Um, you know, we are in a very environmentally sensitive place. So I applaud the efforts of the Planning and Zoning Commission to weigh all, those, all of those balances and to make sure that the things that get approved are, um, are, are gonna work for the town and have been approved by the public through the public comment process. Thank you. 
Um, another question has come up relating to, I guess, a, an unusually high number of new residents. And uh, the question relates to how does this uh, affect the schools? Um, is there a possibility that, um, you know, the Board of Ed will find that they have um, more students than they have planned for? And perhaps uh, Mr. Dream would like to comment on this, what you do to make sure that you're ready for everybody who's going to move here. Sure. Thank you, Claire. And thank you for the question. Um, it, it's a great question. It's something we discuss all the time. Uh, we do throughout the year regular enrollment projections. We do enrollment projections out 10 years. Uh, we work hand in hand with the town, with Mr. Olvaney and planning and zoning, with First Selectman Stevenson on understanding these projects and the number of apartments that are coming in. Um, we constantly look at our class size. A lot of that is driven by how we want our local neighborhood schools to feel and how we want to deliver education. But it's something we continuously look at. I think with uh, the Oxridge Building Committee and folks like Chairman Zagrotsky on it and uh, co-chair Kip Coons and Rusty Schreiner and Diane Boston and Katie Lublin and a whole group of great people we spent a lot of time making sure we didn't value engineer uh, the next school. And so we built in some capacity to that school. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at consolidating the ELP program out of other schools into the new school to free up space. Um, we're removing the portables, which have far exceeded their life. And um, the next set of renovations that we're reviewing right now will also do some work around educational space that's needed. So it, it, it has to be constantly looked at as some of these great developments and additional and additions to town go on. And it, it's something we do look at regularly and work hand in hand with the other town agencies to understand. Thank you very much. Um, this question I think is for John Zagrodsky. Uh, do you believe that historically low interest rates justify bonding for projects that traditionally would be considered an operating expense and paid for by current taxes, things like paving roads? So it's a good question. I think the, um, the historic low interest rate environment has been a great time to do bonding. And so we, as a result, would certainly not hold back from bonding any projects given that environment. Uh, I don't actually foresee interest rates uh, spiking anytime soon, despite some of the inflationary pressures that you see, uh, simply because of the impact on the federal budget. Um, uh, if we start seeing real interest rates on some of the debt levels that we see today. Uh, that said, I think that the right way to look at bonding is not just based on what we see interest rates, uh, uh, how we see interest rates today, but much more what's appropriate to be bonded, right? So uh, certainly long-lived projects are, are appropriate for that, but anything that kind of smacks of maintenance spending, right? So if we think about bonding paving or sidewalks, those sorts of things, it's true they last a long time, but we kind of have a sort of a steady load, if you will, of those types of expenditures that uh, we pay every year. And so the idea that somehow we would just simply uh, stop paying for those and start bonding those. Uh, I'm not so sure that's kind of the right approach. So my, my view on bonding is that we want to, to, to bond appropriately and take advantage of the low interest rate environment. It's great that we're building the Oxford School right now uh, and can bond that with low interest rate debt. At the same time, we should be bonding uh, really long lived projects that, that make sense to bond over time because they're large and episodic and have uh, useful lives that uh, uh, would last over the period of the, of the bonding term. Thank you. Um, there's also a shout out here for the buddy system um, and hope that it continues next year uh, with uh, not only the FNB committee, but the RTM education committee. Um, next question is for the first selectman. Um, there's an interest in more outdoor activities and particularly in whether Darian could have more bicycle paths. I love this question. Thank you to whoever asked. I think it's an anonymous attendee. Um, so Darianna New Canaan worked very closely with West Cobb to come up with a, a bike route that, that connects our two towns because 
Um, municipal connectivity is a really important goal of the Department of Transportation and our regional transportation initiatives. Um, so we have, we have that plan. We were not able to source grant funding to move that forward. Um, but the idea was that um, our, we know that so many Darien residents like to enjoy the amenities in New Canaan and vice versa. So we wanted to connect that with, with bike paths. The challenge with bike paths is that we have small, windy New England roads in Darien, and many of them don't have the appropriate geometry to build the dedicated bike lane and the safety zone that you need. Um, so the alternative to that is to put sharrows on the roadway and just to remind um, vehicles that, that they have to share the road with bikers and pedestrians. You see it all over Stamford. They put sharrows on all their roadways and that was um, their idea of, of, of bike paths. But um, in some places that doesn't doesn't allow for a very safe condition. So um, I love continuing to work on this. We have so many people in Darien that love to bike all the time. Uh, and I welcome their, their ongoing involvement in, in that project. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will start with Margaret's question. Um, and certainly we'll turn it to anyone else on the panel that wants to add in. Um, the big issue, right? This is this is probably um, the third biggest issue, uh, maybe not in that order that we've had over the last year are um, questions about cultural and racial diversity. Um, we are a work in progress here in Darien. I will say, if you've lived in Darien for a long time, you will see that um, we are making incremental progress in that. And, and what I mean by progress is, you know, folks, folks have freedom of choice to live wherever they want to live. And, and we are doing everything we can to be an open and inclusive community. Uh, there are, you know, we've had a lot of discussions in the legislature about um, housing regulations, zoning regulations being a barrier to racial diversity. Um, yet many of the bills put forward really couldn't guarantee that if they were passed would, would move the dial in that regard. Um, so specifically what we do here is we have adopted um, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies in our hiring practices. Um, in both our town, our police department, and the schools. I can't speak for Duke, but I feel um, confident in saying that. Um, and, and through all of our activities, um, we, we welcome people here in Darien. And, and I, I challenge the notion uh, for anyone to say that we are not an open and inclusive community. We can always do better. We will always look for ways to do better. Um, but we, I feel that we're, we're moving in the right direction um, and I, I welcome the opportunity to continue that forward motion. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Duke, would you like to answer the question relating to, this, to the uh, schools? Sure, thank you, Clara. Thank you, Jamie. And, and thank you, Margaret, for the question. And Jamie, um, I support Jamie in, in the way she presented that. It's, it's actually something Jamie and I talk about on a, a weekly basis when, when we pull up and, and um, you know, discuss and uh, compare notes. Um, I will also, Margaret, give Clara and our uh, RTM Education Committee credit in that we had a session with the RTM Education Question uh, Committee uh, which Clara chairs and had Dr. Adley and Marge Sion, the head of HR at that committee, and um, all these similar questions were asked. Um, we can get you the information on that uh, meeting too, because there was some good information given there. Um, we are very focused at the Board of Ed, uh, the district, the superintendent on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Everything we are doing right now around our recruiting efforts um, keeps that uh, in mind as we go through the recruiting efforts. Um, 
We work with a lot of the local universities, uh, state educational organizations, and are constantly looking and uh, seeing how we can do that. I think the exciting teacher in residence program that we're going to roll out will continue to build on that diversity, equity, and inclusion program that we're looking at. But um, it is something that we're focused on. And you know, to a lot of Jamie's points, it's not easy. But that doesn't mean we should be con not looking and trying to figure out how to do a better job each day around that. Thank you very much, Duke. I think we have maybe time for one more quick question here. And um, uh, someone has asked, uh, what kind of a time commitment is required to be a member of the RTM? Perhaps is Seth still here? Could you answer? Though, if you are elected to the RTM, um, you are assigned to a committee in the RTM, which I, I uh, named for you earlier. Uh, these committees are dialoguing continuously, and you heard a little bit of it, about it on education tonight, but uh, we have each committee is, is dialoguing with specific areas within the operations of the town and the people who run the operations. And so, you're going to have, uh, first of all, at least a minimum of uh, five meetings a year for the representative town meeting as a whole. And affiliated with that, uh, it's possible you might also have another meeting uh, which relates to the RTM meeting and that meeting would be of your committee. So uh, in addition to that, there may be other uh, meetings that you go to, as, as you mentioned, uh, the education committee is meeting with the with the board of education to talk about, talk about issues that are coming that are forward. Coming. So uh, that's that's uh, how it uh, that sort of gives you a sense of the of the time commitment uh, if you're a member of the RTM. Thank you, Seth. I think our, we're we're kind of running out of time here. This has been, I think, a very informative evening. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of the participants and certainly thank the Darien Library and thank Jean uh, Sweeney, who stepped up to be the moderator, charting a course into the unknown a little bit. Um, so thank you to all of you. And um, I hope you have uh, a, a nice rest of the evening. And um, uh, anyway, we want to thank also Amanda DeMeo from the library and the entire staff there who has supported so many of our activities uh, this year. Uh, so good evening, and we will see you all again around town outside and hope to do this in person next year. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Clara and everybody. Uh, thank you. Okay.